Welcome back to another episode of The Debrief, the competition climbing podcast here on Plastic Weekly. My name's Tyler Norton. As always, I'm joined by John Bergman, who covers competition for Climbing Magazine, also writes for Climbing Business Journal, and is, of course, the author of, if I can find this picture, it's been a while, he's the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing. You can uh, buy that in the link below. And our special guest for this event is Josh Herlebaus, uh, joining us from, from where in Wisconsin? Is it uh, Milwaukee? Milwaukee. All right. So, so Josh is the the guy behind the new website speedclimbing.com. You can also follow him on YouTube, where he actually just posted a great interview just like a week ago with Sam Watson, who we're obviously going to spend some time talking about. So, there's finally a a another speed creator now that Albert Oak has kind of ditched the YouTube thing. He's he's living some other kind of life, and and the great thing about Josh is he comes from a coaching perspective. He's a, a you said sprinting and jumping coach. So you've got some back background in track and field basically right yes yeah that's awesome um i'm psyched and so because there were some big wins in speed particularly for the usa this week uh josh is the perfect guest um normally the guest goes first but i'm so tweaked out by this world cup that i'm overriding all tradition uh and i just have to start the headlines myself because you know john you messaged me after the comp and kind of just asked we always talk right after and you just asked like how did you feel about this comp and the only word i had was unsatisfied um and uh, and we'll talk more about the reaction of other people. But this was this was the opportunity for like a heavyweight title fight. And they fought it out with kid gloves. It was a bowling competition where they like, you know, fenced off the gutters. It was a tennis tournament where they're using low compression balls. It was it was it was just like half assed when they had the opportunity for for like a true battle of the Titans. Right. How often do we feel like Yanya gets a, a true rival, somebody that can really test her and push her to the limits. And instead, the two of them effectively tied on every single climb through the entire competition. In qualifiers, they were both tied along with, I think, four other women. In semifinals, they were both tied, I think, along with Cheyenne So. And then in finals, they both tied as well. And I know people are going to say, well, she got silver and it's because she didn't finish the semifinals climb, and that's so garbage because I think we all know that these top competitors don't respect or give a shit about the time rules, particularly when it's, you know, let's say there is a finals climb and they've been tied the entire way and it comes down to who climbed fastest. That's nobody wants to win that way in this comp. Like everybody will, will accept that it's the rule book, but nobody wants to win that way. But the worst part is that in semifinals, that ended up being the tiebreaker. It ended up being a count back to a semifinal where Yanya missed the top by like a handful of seconds. Uh, and I'm just so empty after having the opportunity to have a rematch for last week's revelation of, of, a, of a competition. Uh, and so I'm just, uh, I'm just plainly unsatisfied. That's all I can think about. We've only got one comp left in the season and I'm, I, I'm worried about the attendance for Jakarta and all I can think about from Edinburgh is that for the women's lead in particular, it was a huge miss, uh, just completely wasted. I, I don't know what to say about it. I'm just empty, man. Oh, there's okay. <clears throat> it's, this is therapy for me. Cause it really like, it was that unsettling. It was, I was so revved up for Like when was the last, like we, Yanya spent four world cups looking extremely good all season, gold, 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 gold something incredible happens and we get a new face to win in, in Coper. And then this is what we follow it up with. Like that sucks. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let me, let me ask you a, let me ask you a totally non climbing question. Are okay. you a star Wars fan? Uh, n no, I don't like I've watched the trilogy, but it would have been okay. when I was like a young teenager. So you're okay. going to need a different metaphor. Well, I guess. But, <laughs> but I think you'll still, even if you're not a huge fan, uh, you'll still know what I'm talking about. Remember okay. the first time you see the empire strikes back the, the sequel to the first one, the middle episode or That's the, the one with show. the snow, right? Yes. In yeah, the okay. original trilogy, you come away from that. And how do you feel? You feel like kind of unsatisfied you're confused you're like wait a minute darth vader is luke's dad and the the re rebels just got smoked by the empire and all that like that's th th you're not supposed to feel satisfied by this comp because this was not a heavyweight title fight it was it, it was a sequel to the first 
episode, if you want to say that. It was a sequel to the first event, and you know anybody that's ever watched a trilogy knows that you never feel fully satisfied at the end of the sequel. You have to wait for the trilogy to get that full satisfaction. And so I'm going to kind of... We're kind of deviating into my headline here, but that's okay, because <laughs> my, my original headline was actually... I'm breaking a journalistic rule here, and I'm, my headline was a question, which is something you never want to really do as a, as a writer. But my question was, was the sequel as good as the original? Specifically meaning I, Maury, Yanya Garnbrett, we get the same result, the same end result, and yet the, the plot points of them, like any good sequel, the plot points are, are a little different here. At Coper, as you kind of went over, Tyler, Yanya was leading after... Uh, the semis, and then just got kind of out out climbed by Imori in the finals. Here at Edinburgh, total plot twist with Yanya timing out during the semifinals, which kind of seemed unfortunate at the time. But I don't know if we really realized, or, or we had no way of knowing how significant that would end up being, because that timing out in semis ended up making all the difference in in the eventual outcome. But I came away satisfied because for I, Maury, I think this performance was better than Coper, frankly. Uh, I mean, she had quite literally the perfect result all this whole event through qualies, through semis, through the final. She topped everything. Flawless performance. You can't get any better than that. I know you can say, well, Yanya kind of did too, but the, I, I don't know. I'm not as quick to dis that that aspect that you said like oh but she timed out but she still kind of topped it well no she timed out like that's part of the game that's part of the rules of engagement it's not only that you get to the top you have to get to the top in the allotted time otherwise we could just have competitors sit there and take the day to and as long as they get to the top we feel we feel fine with it no she had to top in a certain amount of time she's a veteran with arguably more experience than anybody at, at winning and having to perform at a certain time and she didn't do that i'm so, my yeah, my please. so first of all time like timing out is not that common anymore right um and that's partly because the style of root setting doesn't allow as much for rests um we can talk about the unique part of this wall which is it was generally not as overhung a wall as a lot of uh comp walls are lately which was kind of really fascinating and, and the roots were long but i i timing out doesn't happen often because it's not supposed to it's not part of the sport it is a rule forced in to one for semifinals having a time limit is all about broadcast it's because as you're very well aware john lead comps were ass back in the day because you were just resting your way up you know these 15 meter climbs and you would be on the wall for over 10 minutes it was exhausting to watch it was super boring and that time has come down and down and down to make it easier to broadcast and easier to digest and i think it's had a positive effect on the type of climbing that actually happens because it's more fun but it's not there because it is some virtue of the sport it's not there because people that compete in lead climbing believe a faster climb is a better climb they don't nobody looks at Yanya's climb in semifinals and thinks that that was a better climb and so I agree with you that the rules are set and everybody understands the rule book and I'm Maury won by the book but the storyline here isn't about like oh who won Edinburgh it's about you've got people You've got this climber that everybody's saying is the greatest of all time. We're apparently very happy to just trumpet that constantly. And then the second some other person shows up, we have this excellent storyline. It's like, wow, they're taking down the greatest of all time. We can't accept shit wins like this where they they got to, like all of them got to the top. And it was like, look at look at I and Yanya when they were at the top of those walls. They had another mile left in them. And I think that's, you know, we'll talk about Yanya's post later, but it wasn't even close to getting them to their limit, in my opinion. And that's what's so depressing. I agree she won by the book, but for two climbers who are extraordinary, Yanya because of her incredible like track record so far, and I because of this unbelievable form that came out of nowhere, this like wasn't good enough for us to find out how good they are. Josh, do you want to do you want to hop into this, you know, pit? Sure. And I mean, obviously, this is not my specialty, but I mean, I kind of draw parallels to like how far ahead Yanya is to like how far ahead Tiger Woods was back in the 2000s. And they had to start tiger proofing courses. Right. So lengthening the tee box, like making it so that way he couldn't reach the green in one. Um, and it's really I imagine it's really hard to set for 
one athlete specific ability, but not with Aimori being such the competitor that she is, you know, putting it to Yanya last week. And then again, this week, um, is that a conversation that are the walls, do the walls need to be set a little bit more firm because of the level that Yanya and I can bring to the competition? And then you get those duels that we want rather than the, the both reaching the top and just going by time. So, you know, that's the only parallel that I can draw. Like I enjoy watching it because I'm terrible at lead climbing. Go figure, the speed climbing guy climbs like 512 on a good day. Um, but uh, yeah, um, I mean, competition wise, it is, it does leave a little sour taste in my mouth just knowing that it was based off of time that the winner was decided. Mm-hmm. I, see, this is interesting because I don't, I don't know if I share that feeling of dissatisfaction with, that the two of you have. I might be in the minority here, maybe, but uh, I, like, okay, they both get to the top, but one of them, you know, gets there a little quicker. I think that, I think that's an, an exciting additional element, I guess. Um, it, that 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 should be heavily factored in and and doesn't diminish anything f- f- in my opinion in terms of the the uh the outcome of this climb and or, or this finals and how i feel about it and everything I, I don't know i just don't i don't have that empty feeling that you kind of feel tyler that dissatisfaction let me let me ask a, a like kind of a uh um, a more specific question is, do you feel like in your estimation after watching this comp, you have a better sense of Aimori's ability compared to Yanya's ability? Like, you know, we saw Coper, obviously, but has this event in Edinburgh given you any additional context? Like at most it is said to me, OK, she's still on par. She climbed great. Cool. It wasn't it wasn't a literal one event flash in the pan. Um, but aside from that, I'm, I'm not sure how how much better or, 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 uh, um, not how much worse is kind of weird, but I still don't know where she is in relation to Yanya. This didn't add much extra information. Um, I don't know what to think. I'm really hoping Jakarta is incredible now. Cause man, if, if this was the last comp in the season, that would be a killer for me. That would be such a brutal way to end a really incredible year. I don't know. So uh, like, do you guys feel like it's changed how you think about them? Josh, I'll let you take this first. And do you have any thoughts? <laughs> Um, uh, I don't have much to go off of from I, I mean, uh, she had what, three years off between competitive yeah, climbing? Like two seasons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't have much to go on from that. Um, and since it's not my expertise, I'm just going to defer to John. On that. Uh, you know, it's interesting because we talk about, uh, I's time off the, the world cup circuit, but she had done some Japan, uh, competitions and and whatnot and Tyler I remember you and I had watched her in some of those Japan cups and stuff and and the big thing that we would always talk about or text each other is is just like oh she's doing awesome domestically I wonder how she would be when she gets back on the world cup circuit and finally we're getting some answers it's hard to to draw any conclusions after just one competition but now we she's beat Yanya twice I I guess if, to answer your question, performatively, in terms of who is the better climber, Imori or Yanya Garmbra, I think Coper gave a, a, a better indication in terms of a head-to-head clash just because you had Imori, like I said, out climbing Yanya in that finals route. We didn't really get that here in, in Edinburgh, but I, as a sports fan, I kind of go back to this thing that all that matters at the end of the day is the win and loss column. And the fact that I has beaten Yanya twice, uh, I think goes, goes a long way in answering that question of who is, who is, you know, better right now or whatever you want to say. So. Fair enough. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about uh, two, two quick uh, related things. One was Yanya's post on social media, which she ended up deleting. I don't think it's that inflammatory, so I'm just going to show it again. Um, but this was after, oh, that was very rude of me. Sorry, Josh, you uh, you got the short straw on this one. But after semifinals, uh, uh, Yanya just posts the scoreboard from semifinals on her story and, and says, is it possible to set anything else than jugs? Um, it seems like a lot of people interpreted that in different ways, but I think the frustration was clear was, why the shit am I getting to the top of these climbs still six women in qualifiers two in semis and it seemed like a lot of people thought that this was kind of an inappropriate comment from Yanya or that she was like uh uh, uh just being um like salty because because she you know got got timed out or something like that i think it's completely appropriate for somebody like her in fact she's one of the few people 
in all of competitive climbing that has a voice loud enough to affect any kind of change by posting something on an Instagram story. Like that was up for like, what, like 30 minutes before it got taken down or something like that. It didn't last very long, if I can remember right. Um, And she's just, she's on a crusade to say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm one of the best climbers you've ever seen and you need to set hard enough stuff so I can prove it. Whether or not she is better, she wants to be able to prove it, right? After Coper, she came into this event saying, I'm going to destroy this young Japanese climber. I'm going to blow them off the face of the earth because I need to make it clear I am the best climber ever. And then the roots just don't give her the opportunity to do that. Um, what was the, John, you asked a question on Twitter of just like how people thought about the event. And it seemed like people had comments about the event, but also Yanya's story. What, uh, what did you take away from the Kind of like the internet's reaction from all this yeah this is that's when some people were saying it seemed like yanya was a little salty that that was the word used um uh, it, to me i i think it's totally fine for her to post that i i mean i'm well like obviously she could post whatever she wants but what i mean is um i i the thing that is strange to me about it, and maybe she realized that this as well, I don't know. I'd be really curious to get in her head and know why she deleted it. But the timing of it seemed a little strange to me because I know it was right after semis and there, there had just been that qualification round where six women topped both routes, way too many tops. But the fact is, like, what, less than a week ago, she was in a final round where she couldn't climb you know very far she clearly not all jugs and a route that totally smoked her and and it, meaning coper and so it, it was odd to 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 post something like that when the most recent final round the most recent metal determining round to, that had happened at that point when she posted it was a route where she she got bested by the route significantly and so that was a little strange to me. I also think it's a, it's a little odd to post that if you aren't winning. Uh, and and this is this is a, a weird fine line. But there's a there's a fine line between being in the lead or being the best in the world and posting your opinion about that, your complaint if you want to call it that, and not being in the lead and something like that coming across as kind of like sour grapes. You know, I get that. But again, like, I don't think Yanya get like in Yanya's mind, she topped that route as as much as as much as uh, uh, um, uh, I Mori did. Right. Um, I don't think she draws a difference. She understands the rules and she gets it. But she hates the fact that if she lost, it was because of timing out by a few seconds and not falling. I think Yanya hated the fact that she lost in Coper, but she easily accepted it because she she watched the other person, you know, smoke her. She got to see the other person out climb her by multiple moves and look better the entire way. I think she's willing to accept those losses. It's these ones that she can't handle. And that's why she's frustrated. Um, so I think it's, yeah, completely reasonable. There's some people on Reddit saying stupid stuff as well, but that's Reddit. I don't know. I try to avoid that as much as possible. But yeah. Anyway, last thing I want to say, root setting, I thought was uh, aside from the separation, it was, like I said, the wall angle made it kind of interesting. It liked, I liked seeing climbs that were like a little bit sketchy, such an overused word, but because it was more vertical, there was a lot more precision required. We saw a lot of foot slips uh, from athletes that you might not normally see that on. I thought it was a neat flavor. So I liked using that wall. I liked the way a lot of the setting worked. Like it seemed in the lower parts of the wall, they were getting really good separation. Um, it was too soft in the top, in my opinion, when they got into the roof and, and around it, because it wasn't separating the best athletes, but it was a cool new flavor. Um, and I can't take away from the root setting for the men, because aside from that semifinals, bunch up I thought the the separation for men was really good so I'll, I'll leave it at that we'll move on from from that headline john did you want to uh finish up on on the root setting stuff or can i finally get our guest in we, we <laughs> totally overran <laughs> for like 20 minutes <laughs> I, I would have liked uh if the the upper section of the women's route the orange the orange section would have been a little more cruxy i i I mean, of course, this goes back to all what we're talking about here. I would have liked to see it separate the competitors a little bit more, but it didn't. Uh, but yeah, let's get into Josh. I'm excited to, to hear kind of his. Yeah. So anyway, 20 minutes later, Josh, welcome. Welcome to the debrief. Uh, and yeah, we, we want to know what your uh, what your headline, what your big takeaway was from this weekend. All right. So my big headline is probably no, uh, no surprise here. I did a podcast with him last week. Uh Sam Watson coming away with the gold for men's speed. 
first uh, U.S. World Cup winner, possibly the youngest. Did they confirm that he was the youngest yet? I don't think they have. Um, there's there's a few like like ex Soviet names where I cannot find an age for, but it seems very likely he's the youngest ever uh, male speed uh, youngest ever speed climber stop in a World Cup. I think. So, I mean, you look at uh, you know who he is, like his progression over the last year has been just phenomenal. And to see that he is consistently hitting these times, which not only get him into the finals as the first qualifier with the fastest times, I'll use quotes with that because I do have an issue with one of the false starts that happened, but uh, you know, number one ranked going into the finals and then consistently running fast enough, running, climbing uh, fast enough to, you know, advance to those stages with good times. Um, Brings up another topic, which kind of goes along with Sam. Like the weather was not good for speed climbing. You look at what the temperature was and the humidity, and it's like 15 to 20 degrees cooler than what is like optimal for speed. So I look at all the speed times that happened this weekend and take that with like factoring in the weather. And I want to shave like 0.1 to 0.2 off of all those times just based off the way those holds are going to feel and the way that your body's not going to be as warm as you need to for competing as fast as you want to. So I look at the times Sam put down after, you know, being at youths a week before, and I am just astounded that this is coming out of a 16 year old athlete. Uh, so somebody actually mentioned that 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 arena is kind of notorious. I mean, it is in a pit in the ground, right? But, you know, the word used, I think, was dank, but like kind of a damp <laughs> atmosphere. And yeah, I can imagine it being pretty humid. It seems like it's kind of built like a greenhouse in a former quarry. So you've got whatever moisture leaching out of the rocks and it's Scotland, which is always like raining and stuff like that. And I think it was raining that weekend. Mm-hmm. I, I can't remember, but yeah, it was... Uh, as I'm sure it is 99% of their year, but that's really interesting. Um, uh, the Sam thing, I just wanted to ask you kind of like about what you took away from your interview with him, because to me, for the first part of this year, he was this up and coming kid and kind of a meme. The joke was every time you say his name, you have to always mention, and he's only 16, you know, because that was like the only context that anybody had was, wow, right. he's really young. Um, you got a chance to talk to him. I listened to the interview, but what did you take away from that? Especially because you've been a, a coach in the past and what do you think about this person's mindset and, and how they behave as an athlete? Oh my goodness. Uh, as a coach, like he's someone that I want on my team. Um, not just from an athlete standpoint, but because you can tell that mentally he is in such a good place. He understands the process. He understands that there is going to be, you know, he's going to get faster. There's going to be setbacks, but he's got, you know, a good mindset for what it takes to consistently get better. Um, really process oriented. That is huge for an athlete. Uh, most athletes don't learn to love the process until they're like well into their twenties, well into like, you know, the golden years of their sport. And he's not even there yet. So, you know, whether it's parents, his coaches, et cetera, he's got a really great support group around him that is, uh, um, really make sure that he keeps a good mindset. I think some of it's intrinsic as well. Um, it's really hard to teach a lot of these uh, skills that he's already so good at. Um, so that's why I'm so excited about him with Team USA Climbing because having someone like him on the team is just going to make everyone else on the team better as well. John, uh, you've you've obviously had this kid on your radar. You talked about him at the World Youth Championships where I think he, did he slip in the finals? I can't remember what happened, but he didn't win at World Youths just a couple of weeks ago, right? He, uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember. It's all a blur since we've had two World Cups since mm-hmm. then. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, so I at World yeah. Youths, it was uh, um, it was either a slip or a false start that took him that made it so he went to the small final, and then he uh, won from the small final for the third. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think it's kind of he's. It's one of those instances we've talked about it before with other competitors where it's. What's neat is he's had this buzz about him. He's got this nickname like Sub Sub Six Sam because he was the first youth kid to go under six seconds for a run. And um, so there's been kind of this uh, almost like fandom, cult following, whatever you want to say, for him here on in the U.S. circuit, the national scene, particularly for people that follow the national youth scene, for for a, a good while now. And now. T- Finally, we're getting to see him break into the international scene. And so anytime anybody can make that jump from being a a national standout to an international standout, it's exciting. Usually it does not happen as quickly as Sam has done it here, where you're, you know, you just win the gold right away. Uh, But 
it's really cool. And I think the thing that's exciting also about Sam is I think he kind of fills a generational void. Uh, and maybe Josh, you can speak to this as well. Not only in the the U.S. team on the U.S. team, but also just kind of the Speed Squad internationally as well. Because if you look at the other American standouts, John Brosler's twenty five, Noah Bracci's twenty two, Joe Goodacre's twenty one, Merritt Ernsberger, who who uh, you know it wasn't a name that we've mentioned in these finals, but he's twenty three. So, so, like in the case of somebody like Brazler, that's almost a decade older than Sam. So there's a real generation gap there. So it's finally, it, it's nice to see that Sam is kind of leading the way. We should acknowledge there are other uh, teenage American standouts as well. Richard Lee, who was in this event, he's all, he's 16. Uh, Silas Chang is 17. So there is, there are a number of talented. And that kid uh, that defected for Canada is he? Is he still good? Rape, rape is he? Stokes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh no, rape, rape time for is Great it Britain. Um, Michael Finn Henry is. It, does that Michael sound Finn right? Henry okay. Yeah, Henry. yeah. 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 Um. So. So it, it's, it, the point is, and and that's not to detract from Brosler and and Noah and those other guys. They can obviously still shine, and there's they they, they haven't hit their ceiling at all yet. I don't think. But then you have this younger group. And there's kind of this gap there, right? With like 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds. You don't really see many of them. But luckily, we're seeing this this younger generation now, 16 years old, 17 years old. They're coming up. And, and Sam is he's leading the way. I yeah. wanted to – sorry, I just wanted to ask – or um, on the age thing, like is it reasonable to expect that we're going to see more young climbers in speed climbing in terms of like – because there have always been – like in speed climbing, it seems like it almost edges towards a slightly older age group, particularly in the men. And that may just be we're going through a phase where you had the bosses and the Chi Shin Jongs and, and all those guys that have been around for like a decade. Um, but do you think this is a sport where youth is better or – is that experience something that's just as valuable as it is in uh, in the other disciplines? Um, without getting too far into like physiology, um, sure. experience wise, is going to as you know, it's going to play pay dividends. I think it's a a phase right now that is skewing younger. I think um, in the long run, it will skew older. And part of that is you look at kind of the, the the velocity that they're going up the wall. Like people are topping out around like three and a half meters per second. Um, it really falls more into like that uh, more strength rather than like raw speed type thing. Um, competitive sprinters, they peak out around like their late 20s, early 30s. Um, throwers and jumpers, though, go well into their mid 30s. And that's more around the same like uh, like velocity profile that you're looking at for speed climbing. So I would imagine that as these younger athletes continue to progress, they're going to be competitive all the way through their uh, up until their like early thirties, just hmm. based off of physiology. Uh, I want to I want to let you if you had something to say about John's point. Sorry, I totally interrupted there and threw off the flow completely, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, I already blanked on John's point. <laughs> so could you well, my that? my point was just it's it's. It's exciting because I think Sam is really leading this new generation, the 16-year-olds, the 17-year-olds, uh, because you do see a gap there between the Broslers and the Brachis and those people that are kind of in their mid-20s or approaching mid-20s. And then you have these people that are just kind of like just securely in the middle of their teens. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah. So from my standpoint, it's always great to have all age groups have people that they can look up to and aspire to. So Sam is filling that role perfectly. Um, I do know that uh, in some areas that speed climbing still does have a stigma to it. So um, it's important for younger climbers to see younger successful speed climbers. So that way, if they're not getting that type of uh, like feedback in their own local gym, like maybe speed climbing isn't something that's as respected, they can look and see elsewhere. It is respected elsewhere. We can kind of keep that speed talent pool growing without having any sort of, uh, you know, as much friction as there can be in places. So uh, I think from that standpoint, Sam's going to do wonders for just continuing to develop that youth scene because they can see he's 16. He's successful on the world stage. That could be me. Um, for, for either of you guys, the, the, the Team USA Training Center doesn't have a speed component in their facility, does it? I, I just think of it as a bouldering facility, if I remember right. But I guess what I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to ask is, like, um, Texas has seemed to be this kind of like hot spot for U.S. speed. Uh, is there – can we dump any credit on the – 
move to Salt Lake, the the facilities they have out there, or is U.S. speed climbing right now really built on different local teams um, and different local facilities? Um, like, is that where it's really coming from at the moment? Or can we attribute this jump in the last like kind of year on the international stage to the Team USA organization? Like, where's where's it coming from for real? Um, I'm not sure if John has any uh, information on that. I don't, other than the standpoint that there are those, you know, really successful teams like down in Texas where Sam is um, that seem to be developing their own culture within those different gyms of the performance culture. Yeah. Um, I haven't uh, been to the training center, so I can't speak to what what's available there and like what the atmosphere is like there for uh, training for speed climbers. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's obviously facilities in Salt Lake, right? Like they, they when they were all training for combined, there was stuff at I don't know which momentum it was, like Mill Creek mm-hmm. or whatever. Like they have access to stuff. Yeah. But, um, like Albert it's... Oaks coaching actually in in Salt Lake City now for one of the right. uh, one of the momentums. So yeah, I, I think that yeah, the, the training center, the U.S. USA Climbing Training Center has actually moved a couple different locations since it was built a, f- a few years ago, but there is not a full full length speed wall what they have is a kind of segmented sections that you can just kind of dial in s- specific sequences and stuff but they don't have a place that you can do a full run but from what i understand and from the people that i've talked to there and whatnot they have a relationship with those gyms the the the, the public gyms or whatever you want to say to the point where yeah the 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 squad the climbing team usa climbing speed team and whatnot it, those people are allowed to go to those gyms and train on a full speed wall kind of have an isolated training session so to speak or a pri- so it's not actually part of usa climbing's training center per se but i do think that they're able to to kind of make it a usa climbing focused practice or whatever right. so i do think that there some credit is due to that yeah for sure I, I i think you can't discount the fact that you get the all the top people or a lot of the top people i should say in the country together training together pushing each other together um having coaches like meg coin josh larson and, and whatnot I, I think that helps of course even albert oak there you know that's that's huge too because albert knows what he's talking about obviously and we're fans of him on this show uh, so having his knowledge base there is is huge as well. So yeah, I think there's probably something to the Salt Lake City kind of epicenter. But it, then at the same time, you have somebody like Sam who's out at Team Texas and he's able to <laughs> excel at the highest level without living in Salt Lake City. So he kind of proves mm-hmm. that you could do it both ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just know like I think Emo is out of st- uh, out of a uh, um, not Stone Summit uh, Summit climbing centers like the same place that if i remember right sam is out of um in texas so yeah just kind of interesting that that discipline so much of that love has been coming out of like different places uh over a long time so there's it's kind of just you know honestly it's part of me is still a bit nostalgic for the era when you have a, a new youth world championship and all the credit goes to like that gym right that gym is just so psyched to have born and bred this kid and train them all the way up whereas now the the national teams take a really big part of that credit and your youth coach it may have only been your coach till you were like in your early teens and then you get sucked into the the national program and so i hope i hope there's there's a bunch of guys down in texas or whatever that are super proud of the stuff that's going on and uh, and they can still take credit for that um, well to to, yeah. to that point tyler i haven't talked to i haven't interviewed people on the the u.s national team mm-hmm. in, a, in a bit but the last time i talked to several of them usa climbing was not actually writing specific training programs for them i mean there were right. they would session together at the at the, the training center and whatnot and obviously there's invaluable insight coming from josh larson and stuff but it's not like josh was giving each and every one he might he might be for oh, some fair of point. Them, but he's not giving them a training program so i think there is an opportunity for them to kind of get the best of both worlds where they could if they wanted to choose to kind of make their own training program they could do that if they wanted to get a training program from say the coach that coached them through the youth circuit, they could do that. Um, and then they could still get that feedback from Josh Larson. That seemed to be kind of the the Frankenstein, Frankenstein type of training that was going on there at least a couple years ago. Gotcha. I don't know if that's still the case. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Last thing, just uh, just because it is nice to have something so historic. I just like I, I, um, you know, John. I can't wait to hear your roundup of Team USA for this season because last season was a barn burner for for American climbers, and this year it's just like the depth continues to improve. The kind of stuff that we always talk about from Japan and and sometimes Slovenia of just like you're always just seeing new faces coming up, and it's been uh, it's been incredible. And you know, just to throw back to the last time an American competitor won a big international speed comp was like Hans Florin in 91 at the world championships, which is like a, a kind of a gimmick comp, frankly, like, like Hans Florin as a, as an indoor competitive speed climber is, is not really something that we consider anymore. Um, that seems like of such another time. And it's so wild that it took like 31 years uh, to see another American man at the top of a, of an international podium for for like a, an IFSC event or whatever. So yeah, very very cool uh, progression. Um, I want to keep it on the topic of Team USA, John. I'm I'm just going to assume that your winner for this is an American climber. So if we want to go to our big winners, uh, what did you have from this? Sure, my winner would be Jesse Grouper. He notches another gold medal in the in the finals. Gets significantly higher than. The other competitors, Luca Podachar in in second place had a 31 plus uh, compared to Jesse's Jesse's top, um, and that adds to Jesse also had a gold in Briançon this year. He had a silver in Villar. I think he had a bronze in Innsbruck. I was looking at the stats of the seven lead events that Jesse took part in this year. He made the finals in five of them, mm-hmm. which is <laughs> pretty darn and, good. Story. And at least one of the ones where he didn't was like some garbage, like technical ruling, right? Right. It wasn't even like a low fall. So yeah, he's had a great That's season, right. man. Yeah. Yeah. And and so all of a sudden, as the season, the lead season and the comp season kind of winds down, Jesse Grouper's kind of quietly become the biggest name on the American uh, comp scene, at least in the men's division, which is pretty wild uh, because he just he kind of has this. Like I said, this quiet charisma, he's not, uh, he, he doesn't get the headlines for the outdoor ascents or, or the outdoor sends like somebody like Sean Bailey or even Nathaniel Coleman or Colin Duffy. You know, those guys certainly have pretty incredible outdoor ascents to their name. Jesse, uh, he just kind of does it a little bit under the radar, but then you look at all the medals he's amassed and all the final appearances that he's had. I think it's going to be really, really interesting Tyler, to speak to the depth that you just mentioned, to th- to throw Jesse into the Olympic push that's going to come this next year if he chooses to do it, uh, which I assume he will, because all of a sudden you have a ton of American men that will be vying for for a select couple of Olympic spots. When you think about the aforementioned Colin Duffy, Nathaniel Coleman, Sean Bailey, you also have Zach Gala in there, Ben Hanna in there, Xander Waller, Simon Hibbler. And then you got Jesse Grouper. So it's looking like it's going to be a pretty crowded <laughs> field uh, going for that Olymp- those Olympic spots, which will make for some great competition. My uh, my my hope that a Canadian gets into the North American qualifier is like is very quickly just dropping. Seeing uh, seeing how strong your team has been uh, uh, through the season. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we got to get Sean. Sean McCall's got to heal up his shoulder for one thing. Uh, yeah, yeah surgery, on- man. That surgery. sucks, dude. Surgery yeah. at thirty five. Just turned thirty five. Happy birthday, Sean. It sucks yeah, all the that best. This is him, this is your present, but yeah. That, uh, that stinks. Yeah, Josh, what did you think? Like Jesse Grouper, I mean, I John mentioned just incredible climb. What is there to say? Not much else to say. Um, uh, it's anytime that we're seeing Team USA put people on the podium is exciting for me to watch. Um, uh, I can't critique any part of his climb other than just saying that, like, um, from a competitor standpoint, um, I know John spoke to her, like, I didn't know much about him. And so looking at, uh, you know, prior performances and everything like it's it's great seeing him just you know silently make himself known with just based off of pure performance so Mm -hmm. yeah i think the what's what's keeping me going um is is that like the the men's 
like Jacquard is going to matter a lot in the men's race for winning this season. It is up in the air. Uh, and, and Jesse Gruper's in the race. Like it could be a, a knockout in, debut season. Isn't the right word, but like breakout season kind of foreshadowing to when we do the, the awards for this year, John, but, uh, but yeah, Jacquard is going to be a banger. I can't wait for, uh, uh, to see all these men going. I'm seeing like women dropping out of the field for, uh, for Jacquard up. Um, because it's not really there's not that much contention for it but for the men um excellent and this was the kind of comp that i was hoping for 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 the women's side like a really good again there was that <laughs> brutal uh, uh what was it an 11 way tie um in the semifinals on that kind of press and and rock over move that we saw some really interesting beta from um Aside from that, I thought the route setting for the men was uh, was excellent in terms of separation. And I mean, Jesse just milked that route beyond what all the other guys could do. It was gorgeous. It was a given. And he just kept going and decided to to take the whole thing. It was uh, it was an awesome performance. Um, yeah, I, I don't know much to add to that, but big, big win. He's he's one of those guys, like we were saying with Sam, Sam Watson, how Sam had been a big name on the national circuit and then he suddenly broke through the international ranks here at this event uh and that's always an exciting kind of crux to cross that and i think we've mentioned this previously on this show where jesse was that way too he's a multi-time national champion and so i think that people were just kind of waiting for him to have some breakout international moments and i think he exceeded all expectations with the way he's broken out on the international circuit this season. It's been mm-hmm. great. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, sorry, I was just trying to find uh, uh, find the freaking lead rankings just to double check, but I don't know what is glitching out about the website right now. It's just making me look at team rankings all of a sudden. Not what I'm interested in at all, but anyways, okay, no worries. But yeah, men's feel going to be great. Um, uh, uh, Josh, what was, your, uh, what was your winner from this? We've already talked about Sam Watson, so uh, uh, right. what's it going to be? So similar vein, Team USA, also Emma Hunt. So seeing USA just do so well at this. She got time, bronze. How are you going to make this a big winner? This I'm curious on this angle. Making her the big winner because taking a look at the American records that she just broke twice in a row, um, getting it down to it was a 684. Um, given the weather issues that uh, I saw, like from a performance standpoint. Even though she didn't win, I see the times that she put down, and in my in my mind, she is now a legitimate world record contender. Uh, on a mm. good day, you get her in. You know, I, be, I believe she's going to Jakarta. Um, uh, you get her in a good competition um, with top climbers in good weather. I think you're seeing six sixes from her based off of what I saw with the two climbs that she put together in that weather. Um, I, I think that. She has an extremely uh, like this is just like the like the, the tip of the iceberg that she has shown us with her speed and that developmentally wise, like she will be in that conversation for, you know, winning gold, winning the World Cups uh, with the Kaluchka sisters with. Uh, wow, I'm just I'm blanking like all the all the Miroslav or, or yes, yeah, Miroslav. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, I should have had more caffeine this morning. But, <laughs> Don't worry you know. about it. There's there's only so many <laughs> um, Polish so yeah, women's so, names that you um, can that remember. That and then Team USA because, you know, with Sam winning and then Emma taking third, John came back after his brutal ankle injury and still competed. Uh, he threw down a great time for missing all that training time that he did. And it was just – I thought it was a, a really good showing uh, leading up to this Jakarta um, competition where – um, I mean, Indonesia is going to be there, obviously. So who knows place wise where they're going to go into for that. But from a time wise standpoint, I think that they're peaking at the right time. How did you let's you just mentioned Indonesia. So um, we haven't had Indonesia around for for a couple events. Uh, um, and then, of course, old news now, but we haven't had the Russians all season. And then, of course, mm-hmm. Marcin Zienski, Daniel Boldyrev uh, go out due to false starts early on. Like so for for the performances of these athletes, uh, do you feel like it's as like satisfying? I'm not going to ask if it's as satisfying or not, but for those guys, Marcin and, and Daniel, they've been around for a while. Um, they might be towards maybe towards the end of their career, but they're super experienced and they've they've mm-hmm. got a lot of uh, um, uh, a lot of accolades for themselves. Um, as a viewer, does the event feel emptier not having those athletes there or or is it enough yes. as somebody that oh okay cool 
<laughs> yeah, because I, um, I. So let me just because I an angle you keep mentioning it is about the times and and for me as a viewer, I'm I'm really interested to see how fast people can go. The world record is kind of the is the ultimate prize in speed climbing. It's not the mm -hmm. world championship or the Olympic gold. It's the world record in my opinion. Right. But the storyline of the comp is always going to be dominated by medals. Um, especially when world records are not broken. Uh, and so I was curious because you did keep mentioning times for these people as, as being achievements, um, which doesn't really get affected based on who's there, in, in my opinion. But uh, how do, yeah, so for yourself, it doesn't feel quite as satisfying knowing that these huge countries just aren't around. Um, I'm not the only one. The world record holder that's going to be in your race or like at least in the same competition as you, it's right. going to uh, take the hype level up another notch. So okay. um, like looking to like previous Olympic years with track and field, when Usain Bolt was still racing, if there was a major international meet and he wasn't there, something just felt off. Hmm. Um, you knew that whoever ran is still like literally the top 0.0001% of the world in speed, but you have Usain Bolt to compare them to. So it just doesn't feel as great now if he was in the race and he was beaten and the times were slow that's an entirely different story because now you have that uh kind of like um that like guideline of like okay in this weather in these conditions this is what the best person in the world did and these people did x y and z compared to that um so without having indonesia there it was a little you know it didn't it didn't have the same level of hype but the thing is china was there and you know you've got the chinese athletes that are you know going like 5.0s as well like 5.05 5.1 5.2 etc and seeing that they were only in the like 5.3s 5.4s as well does give me the context to know that the other times that the athletes hit were extremely fast given the conditions um is the average viewer gonna go that deep to have that much uh, uh care Possibly not, but uh, for me, that's kind of why I was still excited about those times because we had the Chinese athletes with those faster PRs to be able to use as comparison. We got to We have to do everything we can to get somebody with your knowledge and perspective. I'm not. I'm not kidding on the Salt Lake City co-commentary desk because the stuff that you've been speaking about in your interviews, but also just in these segments, I think would add so much to. The broadcast, just hearing these weather considerations, hearing hearing the psychological considerations. I, I really hope, you know, it can't always be the person you want, but I would love to hear more of that kind of angle on these broadcasts because for speed, a lot of people, it's kind of an opaque sport. They're just like, well, they go slower, they go fast, and sometimes they false start, and that's really all they can get out of it. But there is obviously right. more to it. And being something that you drill over and over and over and over, the people that compete in the sport obviously realize that there are just depths and depths of in like uh, intricacies to how to do this well and what affects your performance. So um, yeah, let's uh, we'll start a we'll start a petition to get you uh, down Salt Lake City next year and uh, on the desk for an hour and a half. That'd be uh, that'd be amazing. Um, yeah, I'm all for it. Hell yeah. Um, <laughs> I I want to mention my big winner because I'm I'm I think this is a a, a big deal. Is Yanni Garnbrett is my big winner from this event because she cinched the uh, uh, 2022 lead season, um, and that makes her a five time lead season winner. Uh, she is tied now with the only other person that's ever done that. And I'm going to give the viewers five seconds to think about who it is, because I know there's people watching that are like, Yanya is the greatest. And if you think she's the greatest, then you got to know who's done, done things as well or better than her. So take your seconds to figure it out. Um, but yeah, it's Muriel Sarkany, um, who won, uh, won five lead seasons in the late nineties and early two thousands. Uh, and in fact, in any discipline, nobody has ever won more than five seasons in a single discipline. So Yanya, of course, being only kind of at like the average winner's age, you would kind of say her career is going to continue for at least a few more years. It looks like she could be the first person ever to win possibly six lead seasons uh, or more, uh, which is a really big deal. But five is where uh, five is where Killian stopped. Five is where Francois Legrand stopped. Five is kind of the number and she's there now and lead. Not to mention that she won a boulder season, which is a separate separate discussion when you get into multidisciplinary climbing but uh so huge deal she's she's right up there with the best of them in terms of the number of seasons won so as much as i'm sure she hated this competition uh it, she got the points she needed to not even attend jakarta and still take this uh take the season so um big uh big stuff 
Um, and people are going to think I'm like a Yandi super fan now, even though I refuse to say she's the greatest of all time. And they're going to think I hate Aimori or whatever, even though she got the win. But just want to mention it. Yandi's killing it right now. She is on the registration list for Jakarta. Now, that doesn't mean she will be there. We will see. I don't want to burst anybody's bubble as much as we were talking about. We want to see the trilogy and stuff. Uh, as of right now, Aimori is not listed on the Jakarta uh, registration list, but Aimori has been, uh, you know, keeping everybody guessing in terms of her participation at these mm-hmm. World Cups for the last couple several years. So Can I be honest? Part of me, I'm not a suspicious per, or not uh, not a superstitious person, but part of me thinks there is a certain level of cosmic karma that Yanya earned for herself when she attended the first Boulder World Cup of the season and then bailed on the rest. I think by by denying the possibility of a sweep for somebody else, by stealing that one win and then jetting, I think she put some energy out into the universe and and it might be coming back to haunt her. That's my uh, if I if I visited a a, 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 a tea leaf reader or a, a psychic more often, that would be my my guess as to why this has all happened. But yeah, I really hope I is there, but I, I don't think it's going to happen. Unfortunately, it's getting too late. Tyler, can I speak to that real fast? Yeah. Uh, you're, so, okay. So I got a piece of paper here. I want you to give me a guess on of what is on the uh, on the other side of this piece of paper here. <laughs> uh, I okay. I uh, this is pertaining pertaining to your to what you just said and pertaining to your your winner. Okay, that's that's. I'm gonna guess that's you making a. Is this you writing down something from the start of the season where you said Yanyu was going to like sweep the lead season? Is well, that, no, is it, it's no, not I'm... something I wrote, but um, and Josh, you can guess too, and the viewers at home. There's can guess. there's no context on this. I'm there's no chance. There's no chance. What is it, Josh? Do you have a guess? I've got nothing. <laughs> okay. What, That's how... what it is. <laughs> <laughs> here's my here's my point. Uh, here's something I've been wondering and uh, during the Boulder season, Tyler, you and I said, we said repeatedly like it or not, there will be people that put the figurative asterisk by that season, by Natalia's wins and say, yeah, but right. Yeah. But Yanya Garnbrett wasn't there. Wasn't in most of the, the Boulder season. And now, if it needs to be said, to be clear, I'm not saying that that is the right take or the right assessment. I'm just acknowledging that there will be people that say that because detractors will detract, haters going to hate, all that stuff, right? So with that in mind, will fans do the same thing with Yanya's overall lead season title here? Because I think there's kind of some similar logic at play and put the asterisk by it and say, yeah, but... Yeah, but I Mori wasn't there because when I Mori was there, we saw that she beat Yanya Garnbrett, and there was no guarantee. There's no guarantee that if my I Mori had been here this whole season, that Yanya Garnbrett would have won it. Just like people will say, there's no guarantee that if Yanya had been present for the whole uh, Boulder season, Natalia would have won it. And again, I just want to reiterate, I'm not saying or that I'm Natalia would have. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. not saying that there there deserves to be an asterisk here mm-hmm. because, as we always say, you can only assess the competition by who is there, and you can't like take away anything from the winner because somebody else wasn't there. It's not their fault, et cetera, et cetera. But nonetheless, like I said, people will say that. So my question to you is: Does that same logic, the asterisk, apply to this lead season in light of what we've been able to see I Mori able to do these last couple comps? I think that's a great question. And I think like my answer is kind of like history is super unfair and I would not be surprised if they are not remembered in the same way. Um, I think Yanya has been a consistent storyline for, well, I was going to say three or four years. I guess I mean three or four seasons because COVID was a disaster. Um, But she's been a name that's been there constantly and she's proven where she's at. The season, um, uh, the last time we had a full season in 2019, she swept it. Uh, So I think with the Natalia scenario, um, I think Yanya's weight is heavier than I Mori's weight right now, right? Like I Mori was an impressive upstart climber in 2019. We didn't see her for a couple of years. She comes onto the scene fresh and wins a couple. And one of them is in 
in my opinion, one of the least satisfying ways ever, right? So I think that is less of a, a heavy consideration than a Yanya who can feel like a runaway train sometimes that if you try and step in front of her, she's going to knock you out. Um, so I'm I'm interested. I think that's really interesting. Here's, here's honestly something that I think will affect it. I don't think Aimori, even if she goes to Jakarta and wins, I don't think it's possible for her to even get top five in the season rankings. So when people go and look at the history of the season, if they only look at the rankings and they don't look at each event and who is present at, at this and that, because the way data is presented, it's hard to, to, to figure out who was here, who wasn't, why did they drop out in qualifiers? Was it a, a foot slip? Was it them dragging their foot outside the bounds of the wall or whatever? I think if somebody looks in like five or 10 years from now and looks at the season results, they're going to see at the top of the list, Yanya Garnbrett. Below that is probably going to be what? Chayan So and then maybe Brooke Rabatou. And they're going to have to go down a bunch of names before they get to Aimori. And I think because she's going to be far enough down that history will kind of forget the effect on the season. I don't think for the nerds among us that we're going to forget these couple events. I think Coper in particular is going to be one of the most memorable of events that that I'll ever watch. Um, but John, I think I think your question is a great one because I think they uh, I think the weight is different. Um, I think uh, people will doubt Natalia and for the I thing as well, you know, since 2019, we haven't had a chance to see Yanya beat I, uh, which she did almost every single time in 2019. So if we get to see uh, uh, I just look dominant, over Yanya in the same way that we've seen Yanya be dominant over Natalia, then maybe that narrative uh, would be similar. But at the moment, I think they're they're kind of out of balance. But yeah, that's my opinion. Yeah, I mean, it's complicated, right? Because Natalia does have a win over Yanya. Um... Yeah, but like a win, right? Like it is, it is so few and far between. Like there is a clear favorite. Whereas if you just take Yanya and I's head to head over all the competitions, Yanya is still far ahead because of the 2019 season. Um, that's just reality, right? Um, now over the last term, yeah, I's won the last two. Like if you just look at, if you just look at 2022, I is the better track record head to head. But if you look at their whole career, Yanya is still the, still the winner. Um, so yeah, I, I think it'll, uh, I think the context is going to evolve over the next couple of years and we'll see what happens. I think it'll be fascinating. If I goes on to dominate the next couple seasons, then 2022 will be known as, as the season where Yanya or, uh, where I broke out and, uh, and, um, so I didn't, I don't know. Let me just start that over just cause I'm not sure how I said it. If I Mori dominates the next couple seasons, 2022 will be seen as her breakout and as a missed opportunity to take a season win. But it depends what happens in the next couple of years. So, yeah. Let's talk about losers. Let's, uh, let's get into the dirty stuff. Uh, Josh, what was your, uh, what was your, what made you sad about this competition? What makes me sad is what makes me sad about every speed competition is that I don't like the false start rule in qualifiers. Um, in qualifiers and- specifically. Qualifiers specifically. So the false start rule as it is is great in finals because it prevents gamesmanship. You got the one and you're done. So you false start, you're done. You're not going to be playing any games with your competitor, et, et cetera. So like it's the same way in track, and I agree with that. But in qualifiers, can you sorry before speed, before we go on? Can you specify what you mean by gamesmanship? Like what what it is sure. that it prevents? So like in track and field, it was a big thing. At, at one point, you were allowed one false start for each competitor. And if you had a second false start, then you were disqualified from the race. So what you would get are people either trying to guess the gun or intentionally jumping the gun to draw the other people off. So that way they don't want to get a false start the next time. They're going to sit in the blocks just a hair longer to make sure the gun goes off before they leave. Um, Hmm. Now they change the rules to prevent that, both because the gamesmanship and there are some... (laughs) So there are some races out there that were on TV, like a hundred meter dash took 30 minutes of a, of a, of a, of a, of a broadcast because right. so much gamesmanship was going on. Um, so, you know, they, they nixed that. Uh, I think Usain Bolt was one of the first people to get caught by the one and done during his, during his peak years. Hmm. And then people were like, Oh, we need to bring it back. No, no, no. It's for the good of the sport. I agree with it for speed climbing for the finals, but in the qualifiers where, no one's advancing. It's just based off of time. You don't have to beat the person next to you. They could theoretically do this one person at a time. They don't have to race each other. Um, 
the false start um it beeps as soon as you as soon as you false start so that's going to throw off the competitor that's next to you anyway they could just make it so that way if you false start there's no beep you finish the race you get your time you come back down then they alert you that you false started the person that was next to you is still going to be able to do their best at their run it's not going to affect them you find out you false started and then you should still be given your other attempt to be able to go through so you've got long Kao with the um, 5.40 and qualifiers didn't move on to finals because he had a false start if we want world records, if we want the best people in finals, we need to find a way to make it fair for the competitors all around while also making sure that the best athletes have their shot to, to do it. So my big loser is just the false start rules as it is right now because it does prevent it does it prevents world records from trying to be set. It prevents the good athletes. No, sorry, they are all good athletes. I'm talking about like those. The, the top I know what you mean. I know you, what you mean. Yeah, the ones that you expect to see in finals. It, it's going to prevent them from actually being able to perform at their best in those qualifiers because it's going to be in the back of their mind. I cannot mess this up, otherwise I don't advance. Um, the sport is a race. And if it's just based off of the time for the qualifiers, I don't think that we need to have people being eliminated from the competition for a false start in the qualifiers. I, I, in terms of the effect, I completely agree with you. Like it is so depressing for me to wake up, pull out my phone, look at the speed scores from qualifiers. Cause obviously we, there's nothing to watch and you have to scroll all the way to the bottom of the list to see some of the biggest names and they're already out. And it was because mm -hmm. of a, a single false start. And, uh, it is the worst, uh, in terms of building story and, and getting excited about what you're going to see in finals. Now, the, the one thing I was curious about is cause like, you can set a world record in qualifiers. That's like considered a, a world record event, even the qualification stage. With the scenario you're talking about where you have two people racing, one false starts, but they both just continue up the wall, right? Mm -hmm. And the person who false started gets that time nullified. The person who continues gets to keep their time. Does Is there something about that scenario that would ruin the the i'm going to use the word sanctity although that's stupid it's just the only word i can think of is there something about your scenario that ruins like the the quality of a world record in that scenario like does the fact that you know technically one of the competitors instantly broke a rule does that does that kind of invalidate the other competitors performance for world records like not that i think that would matter to me in my mm -hmm. opinion i don't mind if they lose the opportunity to get a world record in qualifiers so long as they go through to finals because i care about the finals but then i'm also like thinking in my head can you then fuck with your like let's say i'm a shit speed climber and you're the best speed climber in the world and i just want to ruin your day and ruin your chance at a world record so i just false start and that invalidates your i don't i don't really know i'm, I'm curious right. if there's like any technical considerations because um, i'm sure there's a reason but Sure. Probably not a good one. Because again, one consideration is the qualification lists for speed climbing aren't that long, at least compared to like bolder qualification rounds. I'm sure we can handle it. We can still fit it in in one day, I think, right? You could go one at a time. You could go eight at a time. It doesn't matter at that point. So I look at uh, speed climbing qualifications like I would like a field event in track and field. If you have a big competitor list, sometimes they've got two different uh, like lanes open, two different jump pits, two different throwing rings. You've got competitors going on both sides. Um, if one person fucks up in one side, it doesn't affect the performance of the other person if they set a world record in those in that initial round. So I, I don't think that it would matter. Um, now, I'm, I definitely probably haven't thought of all angles for this, but I also just know as a fan, it sucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. John? I, I agree with your logic, Josh. I think that'd be great because already something we've talked about on this show before is already there's this little problem or potential problem in the finals with a false start being one and one and done. And I, I don't think there's any way to make that for the reasons you explained. There's no, it has to be one and done, mm -hmm. but it, that's already potentially problematic and this is where climbing gets a little different than sprinting in that climbing it's just it's just one versus one it's not a field of six sprinters or eight sprinters so it's like if one person false starts you can have a real dud of a final as we've seen in in final rounds in big finals and in small finals when there's a one of them false starts it's just kind of like oh well that was anticlimactic um so you already have that potential problem in the final. So anything you can do in the qualies to get 
more stars through to get bigger names through to just kind of like keep the excitement going and not ruin people's chances from the get go at in qualies. I, I'm all for it. Um, and and yeah, this sounds great. I'd love to. I mean, like you said, I'm sure there's reasons as well why they choose to do it this way. But then again, maybe it's just because. Uh, you know, that's how it is in finals. And so that will make it that way in quality. You, you never know. And so it'd be a real interesting discussion to have with some of the IFSC officials and the people that are writing the rule book and, and updating the rule book and whatnot to, to kind of get into this with them. I still think double elimination is the solution in finals. And that might be a schedule thing, or it might just be like, again, a human limit thing. How many speed races can you do in one evening before the quality of the races really drops off? I totally get that. Mm -hmm. But I would love it if, hey, if you fall start, yeah, you just drop to the lower bracket. And now you got to keep on racing that for me from a sports storyline that would be my dream um whether the athletes can handle it whether the the facilities and the broadcast can handle it i don't know that's somebody else's question to answer but i really only think that if you go for the double elimination because like so i'm a huge rocket league fan so anyone out yeah. there that uh, understands how they run their tournaments there's the upper and lower bracket if you mm -hmm. lose from the main bracket you drop down to the lower and you can still win through by going through the lower bracket you just have to then beat the upper bracket person twice yeah. So like already right there, um, there'd be a way to solve that and still make sure that even if there is a false start, you're giving those faster people a second chance to, to, to basically win out through the under bracket to get back to that championship. So there's definitely ways you could try to make it, I don't know, more appealing race wise. Mm -hmm. um, it's still young. So I'm, yeah. I'm confident that there's going to be changes that come in the future. But uh, uh, I would love to have a double elimination. Mm -hmm. That'd be a lot of fun. Josh, can I ask you, since you come from the track and field background, this is something we've mentioned on the show previously, and it's it's not something totally unprecedented. They have had this in races in the past, but what would your opinion be of, you'd have to construct a, a new type of wall, granted, but constructing a, a, a bigger wall, a wall where you could have, say, four, five, or six people, six autoblaze, racing at the same time, similar to track and field, like I said, where you have six lanes, eight lanes filled up. Uh, how, how, what's your opinion of, of something like that as opposed to this one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one tournament bracket system? Yeah, uh, I think the one-on-one -on -one tournament bracket builds a good amount of tension because there's a lot of races. You can see how it's all playing out and who's performing well. But from like a pure race standpoint, if you add, even bump it up to four people for the finals, if there's a single false start, you still have three people that are competing in finals. Like you still run that finals. You just bring it back, you know, and start it and start it again. So you're not going to have any of these dud races where it's a, you know, three beeps and a false start. And, oh, I'm the champion. And I only went up two holds. Yeah. So, like it, it would solve a lot of that because you could still run that finals race. And and maybe it doesn't even have to be four people at once throughout the entire tree. Maybe once it gets down to four competitors, it's a four person final. And that's like the special highlight. Who knows? There's lots of different ways you could put it together uh, to feel a little bit more exciting than I think it does right now. Hmm. Yeah. You could just combine the big and small final into one, one race. Mm -hmm. cool. So, so many fun things to try. Yeah. If only, you know, if you, if you're the lucky person that has a four lane speed wall, the amount of different like gamey different type of things you could mess around with would be a ton of fun. Um, John, what's your, uh, what's your loser from the event? My loser is Cheon So. I've chosen her as my winner a bunch on this show, as anybody knows, dating back to 2019. So I, I feel fine just this once putting her <laughs> in, in, the, in this loser category. I'm a huge fan of hers, but I, I've, I've gone back now. I've, I've watched her attempt three different times, including the time that I watched it live. And I'm still perplexed by her her climb meaning her climb in the final round we've all been on a route and kind of gotten stymied and just kind of you're in this frozen you're, you're stuck you don't know where to go the the weird thing is though she she does eventually move it's just she's in that that frozen position for so long by the time she moves her time is expired the strange thing is she's looking down and you it seems like she's well aware of the clock and the time and there's this great call by Danan it's it's funny because you can kind of track 
the the downfall of her performance by Dan Ann Martin's <laughs> commentary because at first she's up there and he's like okay she's paused she's got plenty of time though she's okay she's got two minutes or whatever and then like a little bit later Dan Ann he says he's like oh she's well she's she's still okay but she's got to get moving and then a little bit later he's like well she, time's ticking down uh-huh. and then by the end he's like time's gone so uh I don't know what exactly happened up there. Like I said, I've watched it several times. I still don't know. Um, it was kind of, Tyler, I think you said it was sort of an anticlimactic final in that sense because, I mean, we thought that she would give this great uh, go against Yanya and I, and it ended up... You know, she she topped qualifiers and semifinals too, so why can't she top finals, you know? is the whole, just everybody gets a top at this event, yeah. Yeah, and you know, the, the, what occurred to me as I was watching it is we have praised her so many times for climbing beyond her years ever since she was 16 years old. She's just come out and looked like she's been climbing forever. Right. And she's able to take down the best in the world. She was able to beat Yanya repeatedly in 2019 and stuff. This finals was kind of the first time when she got stuck up there and she seemed to look at the clock. She seemed to be aware of the clock, but still didn't do anything. It was kind of the first time where I was like, yeah, she looks it looks like a little, I don't know, inexperience or whatever you want to say here, like a little bit just kind of that youthful, not sure what to do. This was really the first time that's occurred to me with Chae So, and which is fine because she's only 18 years old. It's totally fine for her to have those moments and those those moments of getting stuck where she learns and grows from them. But uh, yeah, it's just a really weird, I said in the Discord when it happened, I was like, that was a really weird climb from her yeah. because she, she motored and then just got stuck and just stayed there and stayed there and seemed to be aware that she had to move, but she didn't move. Strange. It was kind of like watching a kid, you know, standing at the end of the diving board, just freezing up. And it's, it's funny because she looks so composed in those moments, but it looks like either she is dealing with some level of exhaustion where she just decides I can't do anything or like the only other one that kind of made sense with the way she looks on the wall is like, is the clock on the ground just broken? Like, does she think she has four more minutes left or something? Cause she doesn't look like she's in a rush. Um, so yeah, I completely agree. It was really, it was, it was a really odd moment. Um, and, and yeah, fair enough about, uh, uh, Dan and commentary. Yeah, it was, it was too bad because, you know, as much as I'm, I'm honestly glad that there wasn't a third top in finals. Um, she looked really good this week, you know, like it looked like it was setting up to be a duel between two climbers. And then after semifinals, Chayun inserted herself as, Hey, I'm still here too. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what to say about it, though. It, it really just is one of those things where it, the lasting impression is like I'm kind of perplexed about what happened. Um, I hope it's a one off um, and not uh, not like a TIA or whatever those like partial strokes are where you're just you, you turn off for a second. Hopefully it wasn't one of those. God, God willing. But yeah, well, I think we've we've kind of been waiting for Cheyenne to have the the breakout or whatever you want to say like the the success this season that she had in the follow-up like you know yeah let's see it. and 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 she hasn't and a couple things first of all maybe that's too much to ask because obviously it's not every it's not that it's not easy to beat yanya four times or whatever especially right? when so she's rested and didn't do the boulder season yeah, right like yeah so the context is different that's one thing another thing is i, I don't know that was it, it feels like it was last season in a sense but it was actually what you know three years ago years ago yeah years ago so uh, who knows how how she's you know what headspace she's in now uh, how the pandemic affected her you don't know um but i think there is something to be said as as we near the end of this season and as we start to look be able to kind of survey the season as a whole you kind of look at che on season and you compare it to what we know she's capable of in the 2019 season. And you're kind of like, Hmm, did it kind of live up to what we thought? Did it disappoint a little bit? Did it, uh, I don't know, but we were, we I we're one comp away now from the end of the, the lead season. And we're kind of like, I feel like we're still kind of waiting for her to have those, another gold medal instance. And it, it hasn't happened yet. So I'm interested to hear what, what people have to say. Cause 2019, was a weird year with the Olympic qualification and that context will always, you know, come up. Um, And I've made the point that Yanya's sweep of the 2019 bouldering season may not be as impressive as we think it is because we had retirements and injuries among the veterans and the younger climbers that were present have gone on to really do nothing. And I'm wondering if I should be taking that same kind of 
angle and looking at Chayun's performance in the same way and say, okay, Yanya being the dominant climber, she just had an incredible boulder season. She did the entire boulder season and then shows up for lead climbing while she's having to worry about the Olympic qualification and world championships. Maybe Yanya is not at her top form. Chayun comes in fresh at the start of the season. She wasn't even somebody that we would have named as an Olympic hopeful because we didn't know who she was. She comes in fresh. She climbs her brains out while Yanya is really the only other contender and everybody else is kind of in flux with injuries and worrying about the Olympics. Maybe we should be looking back at Chayun's season in 2019 and reflecting, you know, there was a lot of circumstance involved with how successful she was possibly. Um, people can be mad about that angle or not. I'm just floating it. It's, uh, it's totally up to you. But uh, yeah, I, I think you're right. It's Chayun somebody that you know, it's unfortunate that she's been on the scene for four seasons and we really only got two. Um, you know, the the Korean team was was one of the teams that really did not attend anything during the COVID pandemic. So we didn't get to see her at the sporadic comps here and there, um, which was too bad. Um, yeah, uh, it's a tough one. Um, my loser is Yoshiyuki Ogata. Um on the men's side of things, it's not that uncommon, frankly, to have people that win or medal in both bouldering and lead. Um, there's obviously Andras and Schuberts and Baileys and 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 now Colin Duffy and and Yannick Flowey. Like there's, it's on the men's side, it's not that uncommon, and it's becoming less and less. Uh, uh, it's becoming more and more common on the women's side too. And it's too bad that Yoshiyuki missed the chance to do it this time. Um, he had a great climb and, uh, and unfortunately was judged rightly or wrongly that he, uh, stepped on a bolt, got downgraded and it put him out of metal contention. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on the judging call cause we've talked that kind of stuff to death. It's, you know, you got to make the call with the video angles that you have and stuff. And, I, I don't have enough knowledge of the situation to call out particular technical delegates or judges or whatever. That's that's not really my field. I'm not there. Um, but the, the angle is that the fact that there weren't bolt covers at this comp um, is, uh, you know, as much as bolt covers have kind of only showed up in the last couple of years, we're quickly taking them for granted because they're such a game changer in erasing these dumb happenstances of of just ruining people's competitions um i mean the, i think it was the day before there was somebody on twitter that messaged saying hey you know i'm one of the judges for this weekend and i haven't seen any bolt covers yet um and then the pictures we started to see from i think qualifications and semifinals it looked like they removed the bolts in any of the spots where there weren't going to be climbs which is usually a lot of work. So if, if that was the case, then that's a huge props to them that they actually took the bolts out of the wall. So there was nothing protruding if it didn't have to. They only left the bolts up if they were going to be used by a climb. So if, if I had to do that at our wall, that would be a buttload of work. So huge props for that. But the draws that you leave exposed for the climb are still a huge hazard as they became a couple times at this event, or at least Yoshiyuki and then other appeals. Uh, and, and it ruined his climb. And it's, it's really sad that it was something that could be so easily fixed unless there is some unbelievable, you know, supply chain shortage of bolt covers, which I find unbelievable. Um, uh, then, then I, I don't have a lot of sympathy for, for missing out on something that is quickly becoming like, uh, for, not by the rules mandatory, but, you know, just in, in common expectations, becoming a mandatory part of lead comps. Like we can't really accept that anymore. That is, um, as embarrassing it is that we've gone like three decades, not figuring out how to put a piece of plastic over, uh, over a bolt. Um, but yeah, that, that was really too bad. It, uh, it sucks for Yoshiyuki. I know he's going to have chances again in the future. He is gunning hard for, uh, for the new combined Olympics, but, um, yeah, it would have been a satisfying, uh, a satisfying comp for him. And it's too bad that it was a, a, uh, an organizational issue basically that, that dropped him out of metal contention. So huge, huge bummer for him. Yeah, if I can just add on a little to that, like from a like IFSC level, the fact that it's not mandatory to have those on there um, uh, to prevent accidental contact, because if an athlete's going to cheat, it's going to be egregious, and you, that should be easily and very easy to see and to judge mm -hmm. against. But if you're not taking just easy steps to prevent the accidental contact, to 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 not punish the athletes because they're there to compete, they're not there to, you know, have their foot slip or anything and hit a bolt and now well, yeah. No, sucks for you, but you know, no, it, it sucks for you for not setting up a route which can prevent that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I say this 
kind of jokingly, but almost not joking, I guess. Like, if I was a coach of a national team, these bolt covers, they're not that big. I would almost just buy some myself and keep them in my carry-on bag. And and every comp that I go to, say, go, you know, go up to the the route set or head delegate, whatever, and say, hey, you know, I've got some bolt covers here, like, just in case. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> because it seems like something that's easily fixable. Like I said, these aren't huge, uh, like, in terms of their size, they aren't huge. It's, it's not that hard to mail them or transport them. Uh, uh, so, or I don't know. It just, yeah, unfortunate, though, that we're here we are when we've seen a solution to this. And, and I, as soon as these bolt covers turned up i think we just kind of assumed okay we'll have these at every comp and it'll be fine and here we are and they aren't at every comp seemingly unfortunately and talking about stepping on bolt covers again just like we were in the pre-bolt cover days so Mm -hmm. yeah um yeah i'm not sure what it takes or what what the ifsc worries about when they make something mandatory for the event organizer like maybe they're concerned about the cost and running a world cup is super expensive and I totally get it. And on top of that, Edinburgh agreed to organize this like two months ago, basically was when it was announced. They weren't originally on the calendar. It was supposed to be in China. So huge props to them for running it at all, let alone on the day that the, the recently passed queen arrives in the city to rest in, in state or whatever. Um, the circumstances around them pulling off the event are massive. And so huge props to them. And so I, I certainly give a certain amount of leeway to the, to the organizational stuff, but for the future. Yeah. I think, I think it would be a regional, a reasonable cost in terms of money and time to prevent stuff like this. Um, uh, yeah, I think it, it doesn't make anybody happy and the cost is negligible. So yeah, it should be, uh, should be considered. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's do honorable mentions. If anybody has a one minute shout out topic of anything that we haven't touched on now is the time. Uh, does anybody have anything they want to go on? Just go to town. John, I saw you looking at your list. If not, I'm ready with I'm ready with three if uh, if need be. John, did you mute yourself? Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I was just looking at my list of the uh, the results here, I, and I suppose just an honorable mention would be Toby Roberts from Great Britain. They they made a big point on the broadcast. Oh, this is his first ever final or first ever World Cup. That wasn't the case, and I think they yeah. they. Um, they did to correct the credit it, yeah. of Dan Ann and, and Alana. They did. I think Alana was actually the one that brought it up. They did correct that. But nonetheless, regardless, great performance from Toby. Uh, he's an exciting climber to watch. I think it's a, it's really exciting uh, for for the Great Britain Great Britain team. I think it's it's cool to have him there. And we've said before on the show, suddenly Great Britain has some real depth when you look at both disciplines and you look at some of the competitors that have made finals this season. So uh, it's going to be really cool. We'll, we'll see how they do at the Indonesia World Cup, but I'm thinking particularly next year, uh, I think Great Britain could could be an even bigger powerhouse uh, considering how young a lot of their big standouts this season are. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Josh, you have anything you want to tack on? Uh, no, I kind of got through my whole list uh, through random parts, so uh, yeah. I'm good. Yeah, my my three are uh, uh, well. I was just gonna shout out Natalia Kaluchka because, uh, uh, or sorry, Alexandra Kaluchka uh, getting her first win, um, big deal, considering she's been up there at the top end of finals for like a handful of years. Um, uh, other than that, uh, John complained about Team USA men not doing anything last week. They heard the <laughs> call, they showed up, they did a great job this week. So. Thanks for watching Team USA head office. Appreciate you guys taking action on that. And then to the IFSC head office for bringing back uh, bringing back the music at the end of the show. Um, it made my day hearing that song again. And I was probably the only person that gave a shit, but it was great. It was uh, super cool. Um, no idea if that has anything to do with me complaining about it, but I loved, uh, loved hearing the IFSC theme song, as we're going to uh, call it. So yeah, that has been the, uh, the Edinburgh World Cup. There is only... I was going to say there's only one World Cup left, and that's kind of topic for another discussion. There's only one more speed and lead World Cup left this season. It's not this weekend. It is the next weekend. It's in Jakarta. I'm excited for the speed event because the competitors there are going to be sick. I'm excited for the lead event because we have to decide 
the first, second, and third places in the rankings for the year on the men's side. And on the women's side, we got to figure out who's going to follow up Yanya in the silver and bronze position. And then later on, we've got that really unusual lead plus Boulder World Cup, which doesn't count towards the rankings because it's technically combined. So for the sake of, of what we think of as normal World Cups, the next one is the last one. I'm sure we'll do debriefs for all of them. But anyway, we're coming down to the end of it. So I want to thank again, uh, John, as always, for uh, for joining us out. And it's been like an hour and a half since I last had to pronounce your name. So give me one sec. But Josh Hurlebaus nailed it. it. Yeah, <laughs> it's been great talking to you. Um, make sure you check out not just speedclimbing.com uh, for, uh, for video and written content, uh, which is definitely worth your time. But also subscribe on YouTube where you can watch his recent interview with Sam Watson uh, and Albert Oak actually was the first episode who's been on this show in the past. So check that stuff out. Buy John's book, subscribe to this channel, like it, all that kind of stuff. And we will see you guys very soon in the next one.